Rainer, welcome to Commerce Talks. Today we are talking about the chemical industry. You are producing products or your company is producing products I'm using now for 20 years uh, in my garage. Uh, um, uh, you're a CEO of Caramba. Uh, and please introduce yourself uh, for the audience and tell us a bit more about the Caramba Group. Okay, thanks for having me here um, today. I'm really proud to be here. Um, yes, I am the... Um, CEO of the Caramba Chemicals Group, and I'm also father of twins. So this is mainly my two main occupations right now. And um, Caramba Chemicals Group today is about two companies, actually. One company is the well-known Caramba brand, which, as you said, is known for its um, multi-oils, its um, various kinds of products for cleaning and maintenance, specifically in the aftermarket car market. The other company in our group is the not that well known to um, consumers um, company called Kent. Kent is very well known in professional applications, also for the automotive aftermarket, and is mainly doing business only in the B2B business. So, and I guess we have many uh, car enthusiasts um, amongst our podcast listeners. And um, if I remember correctly, the last time I bought a Caramba product um, in the brick and mortar environment, that was, maybe it was uh, ATU. Uh, a well-known garage chain in uh, in Germany, or it was uh, the um, uh, uh, Baumarkt, the DIY DIY store. Um, is this like from an end user perspective? Are these the main channels uh, where we are getting in contact with your products? Um, actually, yes, it is because the um, the the consumer products, like you were mentioning, these kind of cleaning products or these kind of multi oils, um, these kind of lubricants, are mainly sold um, through these traditional channels. We recently started doing some business on Amazon. Um, we made quite some sec some success there, but specifically for the consumer channel, we're using Amazon right now. We have not introduced any e-commerce capabilities into ourselves, and we ha we have to know that Caramba actually is far more than the well-known consumer business. The consumer business is what you and other consumers know, and it's a very traditional German brand, which is already existing for about 120 years. So Caramba was founded in 1903 and um, has made its steps and its developments mainly around the consumer market. In the last 20 years, the company has been changed a lot, and the company is now very much focused on several other areas. So our cleaning and maintenance products are also found, for example, in car wash. We are a leading supplier of car wash chemicals. So everything you get um, on your car when it's going into a um, car wash um, channel or street, as we call them, or in a portal, lots of these products are coming from Caramba. So the wax, the additives, the dry cleaner, and of course the shampoo and the cleaners are also made by Caramba. You don't see these products, but you recognize them quite often, delivering great quality. So only a little part of the business is actually our consumer business, which today is less than 10% of what we do in business is in the B2C channel. Less than 10% is B2C. Okay, but but the, 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 the brand is well known. But on the B2B channels, you're not um, pushing your brand uh, uh, through, correct? So I, I, I don't remember... Um, seeing like a, 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 a car wash, uh, a car wash um, um, facility with a Caramba brand on it. So Caramba pow powered by Caramba could be like a uh, marketing claim there. Uh, excellent idea, and, and we would actually really um, we do this occasionally. But I would think that less than two percent of our customers today actively promote the Caramba brand. So this is really um, the exception. Most of our clients there are extremely traditional. So this is a very, very traditional business in the car wash business. And the um, surprisingly is that the majority of our today's business is really private label. So um, you also find lots of our cleaning products, of our windshield cleaning products, um, additives we do. Um, We are, we are a strong supplier of AdBlue um, additives. We are also supplying lots of automotive OEMs under their label. So about 60% of the business we do today is private label. The other 40 is then branded business. And of the branded is um, a significant part is the wash business. Using co-branding in wash is one of the best things we actually can do 
but it really depends a lot on our client. So only a few ones are actively using this. Some do and some do very well, some others don't. So what we haven't managed in the recent years actually to cross or, or to benefit in the wash business from our brand strengths we have for example with the consumer business so we have not yet utilized this and and, and i think there's like a um, tremendous opportunity because um if I, if usually every car owner ha can select between a different like um, uh, car washing facilities and sometimes they are differentiating by price or they have this uh, voucher codes uh, on a weekly basis so you get the best wash for uh, 30% off and, and that's definitely something where um, let, let's say an umbrella brand could help to connect the dots because I want to have Uh, I want to have all the same lubricants on my on my car, maybe uh, because I'm a car enthusiast, uh, and 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 I can find then in Hamburg, in Kiel, in Berlin, in Frankfurt, always like the same the same wash um, uh, washing facility. But before we are going into the channels in too much detail, maybe um, let's um, let's get to the bird's eye view and uh, try to understand the market. So um, Karama is like quite big in this niche, but how big is this niche in total? So is it a growing niche? Are there more car owners? Is Are there more washing um, entities per car per, per year? So what is kind of driving your market? Um, that's an excellent question because when we basically look at our total market, which is also part of the automotive aftermarket, then in total, the automotive aftermarket is huge. The actual market in Europe is about $250 billion. And, and, and despite COVID, we actually expecting this market to get back on, the, on, a, on a compound growth rate of about 3% over the next couple of years. So we expect this market to grow up to $370, $380 billion. Um, so Our automotive areas are very much focused on chemicals. So chemicals actually represent maybe about 5% of this total market. So then you bring it down to still about a um, couple of billion addressable market we see across Europe. So this is leaving lots of room for growth. However, the, the automotive market is, is under tremendous change. So look, look at the change of, let's say, um, engines. You know, we, we, we were all not believing that um, e-cars would grab such a significant share of market within that short time as they are doing right now. When we talk to all our major clients in the automotive um, industry, if they have any chips available, they build, an they build an electric car, even the German ones. Next thing is they build the most important gasoline, most expensive gasoline car, and only then they build any other, let's say, combustion engines car. So the strong focus and the strong change of the engine in cars has a significant, let's say, um, impact on these um, developments in our market. So what would you say the more Tesla drivers we have, the more ID3, ID4 we see in the streets, the smaller is your market? Actually, only in some segments. So let's say segments that are really focusing on the combustion engine, of course, will have a tremendous <laughs> change. <laughs> They will just be disappearing. Yeah. They will just be gone. Because in a we don't need so an like oil change in, in, with an electromotor. You don't need to yeah. change oil. You, know? you don't need any additives like we do right now to, let's say, improve the quality of engine behavior or the improvement of, let's say, gearboxes are also changing. You know, even, even brake parts are changing because brakes are far less used than they are used in traditional combustion engine based cars. So lots of things are changing at the same time. And this is also reason for our strategic positioning is that whatever is driving your car, you know, be it gas, be it diesel, be it electricity, be it, ki be it kind of whatever thing it's driving your car, it's going to be washed. People will still maintain their car and the car still will be washed. And in other segments, for example, um, will maybe, let's say, get under pressure also with the different use of cars. You know, we, we, we all know that when the, within the next five to 10 years, for example, cars will more be used instead of owned. It will happen. We will still own a car we like, you know, but take, for example, um, a car like a smart. That's not a car somebody wants to own. That's maybe a car you want to use for a couple of minutes or hours and then you give it back. You don't want to buy this car. You don't want to own this car. You want to own a 911, but you don't want to have this car. So 
these changes will be more cars will be used. If cars will be used more, cleanliness in internally and also externally of these cars will become more important than they are today. You often see people treating their own car far less good as it as they would expect a rental car to come. You know, we all complain heavily if six give us a car that's dirty. <laughs> Our own car can be for a certain time. So this is also driving significant growth in all these areas of smart repair. E-mobility will drive, let's say, also growth of, let's say, sound dampening. You're getting more aware on bad sounds like you do in a car, which makes its own noise. You know, if I, I'm, I'm driving a hybrid, if this is going in E-mode, I suddenly hear things that I normally don't hear. So there are many, many areas that will grow in the traditional market. However, most growth in the automotive industry will come from digital growth. Growth on the digitalization of cars, for example. Um, cyber, cyber security will be growth factor number one in the automotive industry because it's not going to be fun if somebody's going to hack your car. It's, it's pretty dangerous. It's, it's, it's as dangerous and as frightening as we can see with some other development of things getting hacked. But if a car gets hacked, and this is certainly not a, not a huge problem for somebody with the right knowledge, um, this is going to create serious trouble. But lots of growth in this market for the next coming years. And, and um, let's maybe focus for a couple of minutes on the on the 10% uh, direct-to-consumer um, share. So um, ATU, Hornbach, uh, Bauhaus and other um, channels in Germany are selling those products. What I can see on your website and what I would understand if I would um, if I'm searching for those products is th there's like far more products today available than there were like 20 years ago. So like it, it feels like even different colors of car do request like different uh, products. So it, it becomes way more segmented, uh, which is usually not the home turf of the brick and mortar channels because they focus on, let's say, three meters of shelf caramba products or lubricants or cleaning products and you, you have to go with whatever they provide and within this online channels and you just mentioned amazon uh, where i can find a wide um, range of caramba products you obviously you, do, you don't need to uh, you don't need to peak you don't need to pick the um the lubricant or the cleaning uh, vex for a yellow car, you can pick the one for, for your color, right? For your 911, or maybe there's even a special, um, a special paint on, uh, on your Porsche or on your old Mercedes that needs special treatment. That is usually something where uh, brick and mortar channels are not performing um, really well. So how, how, how do you see this development? Um, I fully agree. I find that I found it always one of the core advantages of online channels, and this is not often mentioned, but it actually is that they could always, let's say, be, be, be far better on the, on the long tail. You know, that was one of the strengths I always found with Amazon and also with other suppliers that you really had choice. When you get into a shop, your choice is naturally be limited because they, they have no, no storage and they have, let's say, the, the rental cost and so on. So everything they put in there must be fast movers or not. So the, all the long tail could not be really taken care for. And most of the companies I used to work for who actually were based on this traditional model, they were all always trying to reduce long tail. You know, they were always trying to have SKU reductions and, and, and product reductions to get rid of long tail. And Amazon changed this by radically focusing on the long tail. You get everything here. So that's one of their strengths and one of the things that really made them big, that this choice was there. Um, for us in traditional channel, it's not such a matter of, let's say, getting more individual products in there. You know, I think that, that, that's not going to happen. Otherwise, you have to, let's say, spend too much on this. You know, every product you get into these channels, everything you get on the shelves is actually be paid for. Somehow you pay for this. This is traditional channel business. It's also happening within Amazon, but on a, on, a, on a different level, on a different kind of what you pay for. And you get far better payback for your investments in the online channels. So if I spend a dollar, I know very, very more precisely what I get back there in an online channel than I do with traditional channels. That's the, one of the big changes, let's say, also for suppliers of uh, products. Um, so that's why we are looking into it. We, we actually have not been very much focusing on this segment in the last couple of years. So this is one of the areas where we will certainly have some significant room for improvements over the next 24 months. So one is actually 
brand awareness, which is not happening very much recently with our strong focus on B2B business and other businesses and um, in our strong focus on internal improvement. And the other one is actually to find new routes to market with our consumer products. Because I think you, you're right, so the future is not gonna be um, the, the um, do-it-yourself channels only, and, and specifically not the do-it-yourself channels that are fully based on bricks. There are new do-it-yourself channels, very, very attractive ones, which actually start to sell the product. And, um, and these are the ones we're gonna, let's say, look more after in the future than we did before. Hmm. Yeah, I, I get it. But if, if if I should argue, like from a brick and mortar store, I would say, okay, um, you have a very good relation to the brick and mortar stores, to the do-it-yourself channel. Therefore, you control this kind of one meter shelf space with the Caramba products. In Amazon and other online channels, um, it's much harder to do. I would guess uh, um, that many, many companies just try to replicate your product and say that's the best product for your combustion engine or that's the best uh, the best oil for uh, for um, anti-rust, uh, for uh, for example. Um, and, and then you're kind of on a bidding war. You have to bid like for your products and for the keywords on Amazon, though your products are showing up. If not, if you're not bidding, then uh, immediately uh, competitor products will show up. That might look the same because uh, if if you go to Amazon today, it, it it all looks kind of the same. They try to even replicate the Caramba uh, brand or W uh, WD forty, which is also very popular in this this area. They all try to replicate it. They, there's a lot of fake reviews uh um, on it on it, and like especially in the B two C environment where you only buy such a thing maybe. Once a year, like e even 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 um, less on the frequency side, um, that's kind of tough to manage. Though, um, w would you agree? I fully agree. I'm always surprised that whatever I search on Amazon for, I get something else. You know. <laughs> Meanwhile, I think it, it it really looks like it's 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 part of the business model that um, that you get something differently. But you know. Um, I'm doing this now quite for a while and you know channel always is asking and very creative in collecting soft margin you know all all, all channels are extremely creative and they had been in the early 2000s and then there were there were these large computer distributors now it's different companies so you know channel is actually always demanding extra soft margin how we call it so you can name it whatever we cut set you can name it um soft benefits you can name it contribution to their expense and 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 also amazon is having a similar model where they have their base margin and then all the other steps so the the, the magic thing is in the end you got to find out what actually turns off to work for you and what not you know sometimes you just got a pay channel Sometimes you have to pay channel because they have their different methods of collecting things. And, um, and sometimes you must make a choice where you actually put the money into. So you can also, let's say, put your marketing money into the end user marketing. And then you actually create something like, again, um, on a brand level. If somebody is looking for WD-40 specifically because of some choice, he's gonna find it. And he's gonna also scroll further down in Amazon when you have find your product. The same is happening with Caramba. Um, still, product itself is important, you know, even if there are fake reviews, even if there are many, many other things, product quality remains highly important. We have one product in the Amazon listing, which became by pure, natural, real, actual, realistic reviews, number one seller in this category. So product is important in this area as well. So product is important. Keep your things in there. and. The brick and mortar channel, you know, is also not going to be loyal to you. If somebody else comes and pays more for the end cap, somebody else gets the end cap. So this is not a different game. It's, it's just different players, but basically it's going to be the same game. It's, it requires also different skill sets. You know, people who were good in selling before, selling into the brick and mortar channel, pushing products in there, might not people you need in the future who understand actually how to actually deal with Amazon. So the skill sets for your salespeople, whatever they are doing in your sales environment, are going to change radically and, and already have changed over the last few years. You know, I'm now talking to people who are completely different than the ones we were talking 15 years ago to. You know, that that's actually something 
you have to learn in management that you are <laughs> changing very much in the in the people you talk to actually who actually facilitate sales. So that's the same thing, but it's also, again, different people there. Sometimes we have guests here with a fashion industry background. And when we are talking about online channels, then Amazon is usually like um, not so important. We are rather talking about like Zalando or about you or, or ASOS. Uh, in, in your industry, is, is it only Amazon or might, might Manu Mano be um, an alternative or Otto or other platforms or Cyberport? Uh, um, for example, or the Böttcher AG, who was a guest here uh, a couple of episodes um, ago, and I would guess there are a couple of Caramba products they will um, they offer. I will I will search in a minute. But from a channel perspective, from from a pure wholesale channel perspective, apart from Amazon, what other channels are important for you? We have one or two other um, channel players who we actually do not serve directly. So the so Amazon is basically the online channel where we have direct relationships to. The other ones we are actually serving through our traditional distributors. So it's mainly our classic distributors who have the link to other online channels. And we quite often actually don't see where they sell to. We see products popping up. Then after a while, somebody comes knocking on our door asking for um, advertising contribution, who we actually did not know that he was actually selling our product. So this is still an intransparent area for us, which we have not really handled very well in the last year. So our focus Amazon, the others not all very, very, very well known, but we know that the Caramba brand um, is, is, is quite widely distributed. Um, I think there will be other channels also being interested, like you, li like you mentioned, if somebody is in, a, in an office environment, there's always somebody in an office who's facilitating this office, who is actually taking care for this office. So these channels will need also part of our product. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Butcher is an interesting one because he is really an extremely good example how you can actually um, grow in a market where all others had been dying. You know, I was I was actually working in the same in, in the same industry. I, I worked a couple of years for Office Depot, and and Office Depot completely got it all messed up, <laughs> completely killed, and somebody small started a new business in the same market with the same things and actually made it a wonderful, prosperous. And, and profitable business just by doing something slightly different. Yeah, <laughs> and there was no magic around. So it, it was it, it was posted on the Custom Zone uh, podcast channel in um, in early April, and it was very interesting that they could grow up to 600 million in 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 revenue. But you just mentioned like distributors that are doing that are like um, uh, handling the interface between you and some of the platforms. And my understanding of distributors is that they they had their role um, in industries that are like super nitty gritty where you have like lots of stuff on the log logistics side um, to solve or where it's not possible possible to solve from a vendor slash manufacturer perspective in the pure digital world um, that is kind of an, uh, a function that is moving into the uh, manufacturer side so when it comes to online distribution or distribution towards online channels there's less likely a need in the future for distributors. Do you see this the same way or is it, do you have a different um, view here? I have a slightly different view because I, our experience is that the demands online channels have um, onto logistics is, is extremely difficult to fulfill. So as an example, so to supply to Amazon is a nightmare. Really, it is. <laughs> it is In the end, it's, it, it's a great business, actually, also if they ship. If you don't ship yourself, so if you have to do, if you let them do everything, it's a, it's a really pretty cool business where you have some advantages and this is really, you can calculate things. You know, I, I like this, find, uh, let's say, I like these ways of sales where you actually are able to calculate things, where you reduce the, the non, non, let's say, non-tangible factors like the human being which is traditionally in direct sales, as we are doing a lot, you always have the human being. And this is always a factor you cannot calculate as good as you can calculate other things, like what you spend on advertising, what you spend on clicks and so on. It's easier to calculate, so more predictable. But um, some things they demand also on the distribution side are really extreme, really very, very extreme. So with, let's say, with regards to labeling, with packaging, with testing and so on, extremely high level of requirements, higher than the Aldi's, higher than many other channels who already has, have, let's say, quite high demands. So to fulfill this, you sometimes may need, may need a specialist. So some distribution specialists who actually can fulfill these things by you just supplying a product 
can be very beneficial. So there is still a room for, let's say, value adding distributors, for pure box movers who can do nothing else, you don't need them because then you directly go to those who actually move the end boxes. But the original, um, the original idea of, let's say, wholesale distributors also was to break bulk into, into boxes, for example, you know, to, to actually do a, a service level. If they don't add service or if they don't add sales or if they are not specific to, let's say, some vertical industry, they will disappear. But if they are, then they will find their way also, let's say, to have a good kind of value there. I'll give you another example. A company we, we work with together is also Lekkerland. Lekkerland is quite interesting. You know, you always see their trucks and you're not always sure what they do. And, and they supply up thousands of um, gas stations with all the products where the gas stations make their money. You know, all the Snickers come from them. Um, part of our products come from them. That's also always distributed by, by Lekkerland. And you know their trucks with the symbol, and the white trucks with the red symbol and so on. That's, a ready, that's an excellent example of, let's say, adding value to just shipping goods. So these kind of, let's say, service suppliers will have a great market, I think, in the future. Okay, and, and regardless of the future, um, uh, the future of the gas stations, which is a bit shaky, uh, um, it totally makes sense that it doesn't uh, that you won't supply um, Caramba products directly to the gas station. So that that, that would definitely destroy your uh, your your um, your supply chain manage your supply chain management. Um, okay, I, I understand that. But you're now in, like, in a situation where you have to look into like e-commerce, like direct-to-consumer, B2B e-commerce. And you're coming now out of, very, out of a very successful um, um, company. Uh, maybe you can get, shed some light on the corona effects uh, in this business because I would assume that people washed even more cars during corona, but maybe I'm wrong. But um, how, do you, how do you bring the company... Um, toward thinking in the direction, having more direct to consumer touch points, having more operations on their side, so which is very different from the wholesale operation. You need customer success, you need uh, B2C logistics, uh, you need uh, like uh, the whole payment thing might be, um, uh, might be integrated in your operation. So how do you do that? Before answering that question, maybe uh, give, give us a five minute Corona update. Really interesting how, how this impacted your business. Well, this was very, very different on, on various levels of the business and on, on various segments of the business. For example, in the Caramba world, um, the, in the Caramba business unit, they had a fantastic year within the COVID year. Uh, unfortunately, you have to say, because um, fortunately enough, Caramba was capable of switching production extremely quickly onto producing disinfectants. So um, within one, within a couple of weeks, we changed lots of the production facilities we have into producing um, um, compliant, ready disinfectants. And this was a time when actually disinfectant was, a, let's say, a good that was extremely desired. So we had um, acquired a few large contracts, public contracts, other contracts on, let's say, profitable margins, on good business, and we were really, really very fast. So the People within Caramba have been extremely fast, extremely good in reaction, in operations to actually fulfill this. So we shipped millions of liters of disinfectant. Um, <laughs> from a society point of view and from, let's say, a human point of view, fortunately enough, this came to a really brutal halt <laughs> when all this disinfectant wasn't used anymore and wasn't needed anymore. So the, so the last um, tons, the last 50 pellets full of disinfected I actually um, gave as a donation to the Ukraine, to the U Ukraine R Red Cross to help the people there because we actually were not selling this year disinfectant anymore. But um, at the last years, this was very, very beneficial and boosting Karamba top line and also um, um, results. Um, in Kent, the, de the development had been, let's say, different. In Kent, the development was really like um, the Kent business, which is 99% traditionally driven by selling on-site. On-site at the customer, salesperson goes there, sells there. This was completely <coughs> halted at the time when we actually had been in lockdown. So then um, sales had to be changed tremendously quick onto other methods, onto other ways of selling. So people then had to call, suddenly people who were used like 24, 20 years in direct sales on the street 
They now had to start using the telephone. They now had to start using Teams. Like many other companies had the same challenge. So Kent came out of this pretty strong, pretty good, but the first month has had been a tremendous, let's say, way of change, really difficult change for the people there who were not used to this. They made this over time, and now nowadays they actually are using a more like a system where they also go outside and visit clients, but they also use days and times for telephone. So they learned from this. Um, what we all missed terribly in this time was that we have zero e-commerce capabilities. You cannot even place an, a single order to us <laughs> as a client in both companies, not in Caramba and not in Kent. In Kent, we have started our way going into a digital solution, finding an e-commerce solution within the next couple of months. We have, let's say, selected partners we want to grow with. We have selected or we have, let's say, identified, we have made a shortlist. So we did all the work before to get ready there and to start this. And the core challenge there for us will be not the technology, it will be actually combine direct sales with online sales to, to, to make this coexisting, to actually make this benefiting from each other and not to be in a competitive situation. We don't want to have competitive scenarios inside. Um, maybe a bit, but, but not too much. So, um, and in Caramba, we are extremely early on our, let's say, path into a digital world. We, we, are, we are really <laughs> old. Um, we, are, we are beyond stone, but, but we are not far beyond this, this age. We are really um, having lots, let's say, of possibilities if we want to start getting into a digital world. So, so like having more direct access to customers, having more interaction, learning more from customers. Also, you know, all the other benefits you get beyond, um, let's say, more reach and, 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 and lower cost. You know, you reduce not only transactional cost or you, you may be reducing your acquisition cost, but you also get insights, which is something, which is one of the best things you also get from, let's say, having direct contacts, which you can have far better through e-commerce than for many, many other things. So lots of potential, but um, very early in the stage. But did, did it help like from a transformation point of view to um, to drive understanding of the role of e-commerce inside of the company? So when people really realized, okay, we have two few channels actually where people can contact us via an online platform, app, EDI, whatever. So, so did it help from a transformational standpoint? Yeah, um, it helped a lot into in, in, in the Kent part of the business, which is the professional Uh, business, they had helped a lot that also people get ready for this because also salespeople understood, you know, if you don't see your client and the only way for your client is to place an order for you and you can't see him, you're getting in trouble, seriously in trouble and you have to change something there. So they started to um, expect e-commerce to come as something that is beneficial to them and not a threat to them. That, that's, that's there and that's ready and, that, and there we are ready to roll out. We will do this in the next couple of months, make the choice, roll it out. In Caramba, it's different. With our large automotive OEM clients, we have fully highly integrated EDI solutions. So that's not kind of e-commerce, that's basically sending text files, you know, <laughs> that's, that's very, t the EDI is maybe <laughs> as old as computers are and you send a basic text file and you add something to it but it's not let's say e-commerce it's just like a, a an order and 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 and, and ordering and, and and supply chains kind of system so not really e-commerce um, but that's very very common with our large clients all do this all there is ready um, in the rest of the caramba world we had been really struggling to get an idea on how we actually will handle this how we actually want to do this you know we are still not fully um, clear on, on what's going to be the next steps there. How do you really get, for example, um, um, benefits of ordering online if you still need to acquire your client completely on site? That's a very, very important question for us. You know, I don't believe that just turning orders into electronic orders is adding enough value. So we actually need to find areas where we can add value to our clients' business And, and not just create, um, put, put the order into a computer is, is not really adding value. That's, that, that's not a radical change, you know, that, that would add value, you know. Um, for our clients, it's very convenient if somebody comes up, picks up the order and um, checks the rem remaining boxes on the shelf 
and then it gets chipped. So how do we add value to this? In this business we do at the Cabramba is not as easy as it is in many other businesses. So, and, 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 and just doing digital for the digitalization would not really benefit the company. It also doesn't bit benefit the client. So here we have to do more research and we have to learn more about this. I would think that not necessarily specifically in the, in the B2B business, a solution we do by ourselves would be enough. I would actually expect that it would starting to add benefit if the client would also, let's say, have access to other parts of his processes and not just to Caramba products. You know, setting up all this for just ordering Caramba might not, might not really add benefit to the client. We may have to, let's say, look, look beyond this, look at platforms, look at corporations with others and so on. But just right now, open up a Caramba shop, maybe, maybe a bit for consumer, but, but maybe not necessarily changing the game. Mm. That, that's true. I, I, I highly, I highly agree. Um, so, if you're looking forward to 2022, 2023, so end 2022, so what are the next big steps from your point of view? Is it like really helping your team to understand and to learn what what's going on, finding the right entry point? Could be also something where you say, let's scale our Amazon team, let's be the best uh, uh, lubricant oil seller on on this. Uh, platform. Let's skip maybe uh, D2C. W what's kind of the next steps from your point of view? Um, for for Caramba, the, the last nine months since I had been appointed to the CEO role of the, of the group was really focusing on developing a strategy that actually is, is really finding the right focus. You know, for us, it, we had seven areas of business. So it's not only consumer, it's not only car wash, it's also private label OEM, it's also industry business, it's, it's, it's many, many other businesses. Some of them had been extremely um, small, some of them had been not profitable, some of them had been, so for us it was really to find the right focus and also how to set up the company. That's what we have been doing. So now, as we know this, and also over the last two years, we had been very, very active in restructuring some areas. We call this ex actually um, a full potential execution Mainly it was related to cost reduction. So really putting the company on, on a more stable base. We did this. Now the good thing is now, now we, get, now we can start doing the fun things because actually we have done the, the homework. Now we can start to grow. So the key for Caramba Future also, which had been approved by the advisory board is really focus on some selected growth initiatives. One of these growth initiatives is that we actually focus our growth very, very much on the area of car wash. We have pretty good market information. We, we know this market well, and we have leading product. You know, a couple of things actually give us some good reasons. The market is, is growing, although the automotive market isn't changed. The market will stay, the market is growing. We know what we do there. We have excellent own R&D. So we, you know, I grew up in product. I was a product manager as my first <laughs> profession and I still believe in product. Good product makes a difference, you know. You can lots of things you can do lots of things wrong when you have good product, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you, you you can also help bad products to perform better with many other good things doing well. But if you have good product, it's a very, very good base. And your customers usually honor this. You know, you can have crappy operations, they forgive you if you if you repair and so on. If you have good product, you know that that's part of the things how things go. So we have Good product, we are very, very responsive to changes. For example, we address these things like environmental requirements more and more in the car wash industry. We have recently introduced something completely different for car wash that actually helps our clients to save water. So these things are really innovative. So we are strong and innovative in wash, but we had to set up a clear strategy. We do wash. We don't do this, we don't do that, we do Mobility wash. Mobility wash means cars, trucks, trains, planes perhaps, everything that is moving and also new kind of things that are moving like scooters and so on. All these, all these things got to be washed and we are going to focus on this. So this is the thing I, I'm very much looking for to say really we have a clear focus, we have a clear target where we want to go. Yeah. We know we want to double our business by 2026 in wash and do double our mar market share there. And um, we don't want to do this by purely acquiring others. We want to do this by ourselves. 
So changing wash and changing the paradigm of wash is, is the core thing. That's going to be fun as well. Yeah, it's a, it, I think it's a good claim. So we are washing everything that moves. Uh, so it's definitely something people can uh, uh, can remember, and uh, and it's much more than just some lubricants and and rust uh, uh, and rust um, um, solutions or anti-rust um, um, solutions. Yeah, super interesting. So I definitely like to follow up uh, with you when the first steps direct to consumer um, are done. When like the next part of the learning curve uh, is done, I highly I highly support the idea of having a, a caramba support by Caramba claim uh, at the at the car wash facilities I think that will definitely help um, um, help you the car wash facilities and uh, um, and the and the car owners um, Rainer thank you for your time thank you very much thank you for having me here it was a pleasure thanks